Welcome, everybody, to today's event, Artificial Intelligence Research in Japan, Challenges at the Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence Project. This event is hosted by Japan House London in collaboration with the Embassy of Japan in the UK. My name is Simon Wright. I am Programming Director at Japan House London, uh, which is a venue on three floors on Kensington High Street in London with an exhibition space, event space, uh, shop, uh, tourism uh, corner, and, and also a restaurant. Before we start, I would like to mention uh, a few things for those of you who are with us today. Please note that your microphone and webcam will be disabled for the entire duration of the event. However, please do use the question and answer feature to type your questions for our main presenter uh, or, or, or the moderator as well at any time throughout the session. If you do not want your name to be attached to your question, please check the option send anonymously. Questions will be collected by Japan House moderators and a selection will be answered live at the end of the event. Please note that we may not be able to answer all the questions during the session, however. Please note that the contents of this event will be streamed live on Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn, where a recording will be archived later. So today's event is broadcast live from the UK and from Japan. Japan House is based in London and shortly I will be handing over to our moderator for today, robotics expert Professor Sethu Vijayakumar, Professor of Robotics at the University of Edinburgh and Programme Director in Artificial Intelligence at the Alan Turing Institute. Professor Vijayakumar will introduce today's main presentation by Professor Sugiyama Masashi, who is Director of the Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence Project Riken AIP, who is joining us from Tokyo in Japan. Professor Sugiyama's presentation will be followed by some comments by Professor Vijayakuma and an audience question and answer session. So please do send in your questions using the Zoom question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. I would now like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Professor Sethu Vijayakuma. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. It's, uh, it's a great privilege to, to, to have you with us. Thank you so much. For those of you watching who, who may not know who, who Professor uh, Vijay Kumar is, uh, may I give a, a short introduction? He is Professor of Robotics at the University of Edinburgh and the founding director of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics. He is also Programme Director for Artificial Intelligence at the Alan Turing Institute. He has pioneered the use of large scale machine learning techniques in the real time control of several iconic robotic, robotic platforms. And one of his projects in 2016 involves a collaboration with NASA Johnson Space Center on the Valkyrie humanoid robot being prepared for unmanned robotic de pre-deployment missions to Mars. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh a judge on BBC Robot Wars and winner of the 2015 Tamdiel Prize for Excellence in Engaging the Public with Science. Welcome, Professor Vijay Kumar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon, for this uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it's great to be part of this event, a truly distributed international event, as you can see um, from the venues where we are transmitting from. So before I introduce Masashi, uh, let me spend a minute uh, just uh, explaining my involvement with Japan. So I've always admired Japanese culture, Japanese food, Japanese science, uh, as I did my PhD uh, in Japan and in Tokyo um, during the early part of my career. And it's great to see Japanese AI and machine learning growing by leaps and bounds as you can see the examples uh, that you're going to hear about the exciting science that's happening at the Riken AIP. So I had the privilege of engaging with the Riken Brain Science Institute before the AIP and also hosting Professor um, Masashi Sugiyama here in Edinburgh, including collaborating with a lot of the projects that he's involved in. So um, without much ado, let me just give a brief introduction to Masashi's illustrious career. Um, so Masashi Sugiyama is currently the director of the Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence Project. 
He's received his doctorate of engineering in computer science from the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan in 2001, following posts as assistant professor and associate professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. He became a professor at the University of Tokyo in 2014. Since 2016, he has been concurrently serving as the director of the Rikin Center for Advanced Intelligent Projects. Um, his research interests include theory and algorithms of machine learning and its application. And he was the recipient of the very prestigious Japan Academy Medal in 2017. So without much ado, let me take this opportunity to hand over uh, to Masashi for, and I'm looking forward to an exciting uh, 30 minutes of introduction of your exciting work at AIP and the broader research um, in AI and machine learning in Japan. Over to you, Masashi. Okay, hello everybody. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. So my name is Masashi Sugiyama. So minasan konnichiwa. So I'm speaking from Japan, Tokyo. So actually the situation in Tokyo is a bit strange this week because we had the we started the fourth state of the emergency from this Monday. But next week we're going to have the Olympic games. So the situation is a bit complicated now in Tokyo. So today my talk is about AI research in Japan challenges at weekend AIP. So Riken is a basic research center in Japan. It's actually quite big. And Riken is working on like biological research, physics research, chemistry research, and also supercomputer research. And Riken founded Center for Advanced Intelligence Project in 2016 under the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, MEXT. So our main office is, is actually located in the heart of Tokyo. So this is a building that okay, we are located. Like the first four floors are a shopping mall, and our floor is 15th floor somewhere here. So it's located in Nihonbashi. It's actually quite close to the central Tokyo station. So in this building, we have a nice open discussion space like this. Actually, my background is also like this. And also we have in-house GPU servers. And in addition to our central office, so we have actually distributed office because we have several teams in different universities. So at the north, it's Sendai, Tsukuba, Washiga, Kyoto, Nara, Osaka, Fukuoka. So it's quite distributed across the entire country. So in AIP, we have five missions, five research missions. The first mission is to develop next generation AI technology. So here, so we basically do fundamental mathematical research on machine learning and optimization. So we have actually a lot of mathematicians and also like theoretical physicists to study these basic problems. Then the second challenge is to accelerate scientific research. So nowadays doing science research is quite difficult. For example, in cancer research, we have tons of data and it's almost impossible for humans to really analyze data. So we need a clever, intelligent data analysis system. Or in material science, we have a large number of papers, like thousands of papers every year, even maybe tens of thousands of papers every year. Then basically, nobody can read all papers. Then, so we need to use AI to read papers to understand what, what is going on in the community. And similar thing is happening in genomics. And the third challenge is, to solve socially critical problems, particularly in Japan. Like we suffer natural disasters like typhoon, flood, and things like that, or earthquake. And also, so we are in the super aged society now. So elderly healthcare is quite an urgent topic for us. I think the situation is a bit similar in UK, but natural disaster and elderly healthcare are really you know, top priority social problems in Japan. Then the fourth challenge is the study of ethical, legal, and social issues of AI. The first three topics are more like technological topics, but the fourth one is not really. So we are also interested in like designing ethical guidelines of using AI or efficient management of personal data, etc. Then finally, so we also try to grow researchers and engineers in, in the AI community. So many companies, many 
universities, so we need more AI researchers and engineers, but still the number is quite limited. So kind of education and human resource development is also an urgent challenge for us. So we are working on these five missions. So this is a rough statistics. So we have about 140 employed researchers and 30% international and 20% female researchers. Then we have about 300 visiting researchers and 60 local students. And also we, are, we have been accepting 140 international students, international interns. But because of this corona pandemic, we are stopping the internship program now. Hopefully we can resume the program in the near future. And also we are very much interested in ex extensive collaborations. Like in the center, we have three industry collaborative centers together with NEC, Fujitsu, Toshiba companies. And in addition to these three collaboration centers, we have more than 40 standard industry projects. And also we have more than 40 international collaborators. And one of the most important collaborators for us is definitely the Alan Turing Institute. So this is just two years ago, so 2019. So we had memorandum of understanding with the Alan Turing Institute and Professor Vijaya Kumar came to Tokyo and we had a nice event here. Then, so this is just you know, two years back in summer. So AIP people so from Japan, so we visited Edinburgh and we had the UK Japan robotics and AI workshop. So we had a nice picture here. And this was taken in, in, the, in the University of Edinburgh. But the next day, we actually moved to London and we had another workshop in the Japan Embassy in London. So that was a very nice memory, but it was only two years ago. I hope I can be back to London in the near future. So these two events are quite big news for me, but as a computer scientist, even bigger news for me is the Alan Turing. So he's on the bill now. So I didn't see this real bill yet. So I hope to visit London and really have this bill in the near future. So this is a big news for computer scientists. Okay, so then let me come into a more research topic. So we are interested in the technology called machine learning. So this is actually the core of current AI. The purpose of machine learning is to let the computer learn like humans, like us. And this machine learning technology is really successful in many applications like speech recognition, image understanding, natural language translation, or inter internet advertisement and things like that. However, current machine learning has, still has limitations. The typical one is its data hungriness. So current machine learning requires big label data for training the system. And this is sometimes not possible in depending on applications. Then another drawback is it's, it, it is black box. So this means it cannot be really interpreted by human easily. So we try to overcome these you know, limitations of current machine learning and try to explore new areas of AI applications. So that's our challenge. So first we try to develop new machine learning theory to overcome these limitations. Then, so explore new machine learning applications beyond current machine learning. Then also we try to design new machine learning society with appropriate SQL discipline and data circulation systems. So then, so let me go to the more detailed research results. So first area is machine learning application. The first topic is cancer, so prostate cancer diagnosis. So pr prostate cancer accounts for 10% of male cancers in Japan. So this is a graph taken from the National Cancer Center in Japan. So male patient, so like stomach cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, and prostate cancer. So these are you know, quite big, big factors. For, for Japan, but I think this is quite common over the world. So th that's why we need automatic diagnosis system. But if we want to have an automatic diagnosis system, we usually use a technology called supervised classification. 
So this basically means that, so we first collect pathological, pathological images, and then we ask medical doctors to say, this image contains you know, cancer or not. Then, so we try to collect such label data, annotated images, as many as possible, and train the system. So that's called supervised classification. And in principle, this supervised classification works quite well if you have a large number of high quality annotated pathological images. But on the other hand, this increases medical doctor's burden. In particular, under this corona pandemic situation, we, we can't really ask medical doctors to you know, help train AI systems because they are too busy nowadays. So then we decided to use unsupervised deep learning for feature extraction. So uns unsupervised learning means we don't really use annotation, but we ask AI to automatically discover important features. To do so, we used 11, more than 11 billion unlabeled pathological image patches like, like this for extracting meaningful features from images. Then, so interestingly, in addition to the standard feature called the Gleason score. So this is a kind of popular standard score to, to, to be used in the medical domain. We discovered new, new features. For example, interstitium change. So we have a cancer cell here, but actually not only inside this cancer cell, but outside the cell also plays an important role. So this kind of feature was automatically discovered by AI. So by that, so we can really improve the you know, prediction accuracy. So like some score for one year recurrence prediction was increased from 0 0.744 by pathologist to 0 0.82 by our system. But interestingly, if we combine so pathologist and our system, so human and AI combination, this further improved the performance. And now the final score is 0 0.842. So this is really high. And quite useful in practice. So now we are trying to really implement this technology in a real system. And also we are trying to explore new applications like in stem cell research, iPS cells, or leukemia and breast cancer. The second interesting application is called ghost cytometry. So this is actually quite interesting. So we are interested in classifying cells. So suppose we have a small cell like this. Let's consider stem cell. So we are growing a stem cell. And if it goes well, it really becomes a you know, nice IPS cell. But often it becomes a cancer. So then we need to somehow dispose the cancer cells. And we want to this classification automatically with a real time speed. To do so, we have a small pipe like this. And liquid is inside. Then cell is going through the pipe, and we do actually automatic classification inside. So we have a special illumination system here, and cell is uh, features are extracted here. And we want to use the standard deep learning technique because it's actually quite powerful in image classification. But we found that it's too slow because it, it's a you know liquid flow, so it's very fast. So inference by deep learning is actually rather time consuming and it was a bit too slow. So we decided to actually use a like, special illumination pattern like this. And then, so it's more like after deep learning, we have already extracted features and this extracted feature is directly illuminated to the cell. Then, so classification can be done really in real time. And then if the cell is regarded as a cancer, so it is, going down and it is discard, disposed here. And if it's an IPS cell, uh, good one, then it goes straight and kept here. So already we have found a startup company to industrialize this system. And also we are further applying this technique in two more than IPS cells. Then the third topic is earthquake cycle prediction. So earthquake is a big, big issue in Japan. So we are really having a lot of earthquakes. And in particular, Nankai Trough. So this is actually Japan main island. Tokyo is here. 
and Osaka, Kyoto is somewhere here. So Nankai Trough is here. So this Nankai Trough is regarded as one of the most dangerous places. And it is located south of Japan and expected to cause a big earthquake in the near future. So many people say near future for many years, but it must be in the near future, really. So this is a big issue. So risk assessment is really indispens indispensable for the entire society. And expected epicenters are somewhere here. So once something is happening here, then we have a serious damage to the big cities. Since this is an important topic, there's actually a long history of research. And already there's a powerful mathematical model of plates, like equation of motion of ocean plate, shear stress and land plate friction force. So there are actually a lot of equations and that really nicely model the you know, system, but it contains a lot of parameters. Like for example, friction parameters located here. So AI, BI, and LI. And I is actually a location index. So this means that so we have actually quite a large number of parameters to be tuned. So this model is quite powerful and realistic, but there are a lot of tuning parameters. And to tune these parameters, we need a lot of data. But earthquake is, is not so frequent to tune these parameters. So that, that's the challenge here. So we don't have enough supervised data to tune these friction parameters. Then a new technology called simulation-based machine learning appeared. So in this simulation-based machine learning, we alternately perform simulation and learning. By simulation, so we first set friction parameters by some way. Then we simulate data, so generating artificial data by induction like this. Then based on this generated artificial data, we train a model and we estimate the friction parameters again. And this is repeated many times until convergence. Because this is simulation, so we don't really have to collect real data. Then by that, so we can actually improve the prediction of earthquake cycles quite highly. Like previously, by some naive method, the prediction error of the earthquake cycle was actually more than 100 years. So it was not really useful in practice. But now after this simulation-based machine learning, it's like 6.5 years or 11 years. So almost 10% of the original one. So the, the performance is much improved. Then the last one is AI-based education support. So we are interested in teaching and learning essay writing because this is very difficult. Actually, the story behind this is so okay, for uh, so we have a national entrance exam for the universities, and the new one, okay, new entrance exam started from this year, and the government originally tried to introduce writing essays. So then, so you know, evalu evaluating essays is really time consuming, and maybe half a million students are taking exams. So there's a kind of demand to automate this essay evaluation part. Then at the same time, so students want to learn how to write good essays. So then the so teaching support by AI is also quite important. But unfortunately, because of this corona pandemic, the system, the entrance exam has not really changed completely and essay writing was, was not in, introduced in the end. But still, you know, improving the writing skill is quite important. And we want to develop a nice system supporting students and teachers. And our goal is to automatically evaluate short essays. And again, this is a quite challenging problem because you know, collecting data is really time consuming because we need to ask many students to write essays and then we need to ask teachers to evaluate, evaluate them. So this is extremely time consuming. So to avoid this problem, we used state-of-the-art machine learning techniques like semi-supervised learning or self-training. So by that, we can learn the system only from 200 to 400 supervised data, but still we can achieve human level evaluation performance. But still suppose like our writing is evaluated by AI. So this is somewhat unclear. Like if you are said your writing is only 50 point. So this is quite bad. So I, I can't believe it. So this must be much better. So explainability is quite important. So to achieve this goal, 
we decided to output prediction confidence and also base cases. So by that, somehow students can understand why his or her writing was evaluated in this way. Already we have a nice interactive system running like this. Okay, that was the machine learning application part. The next is machine learning society. So we are interested in AI ethical guidelines. So we have contributed to the discussion on privacy, fairness, security, etc. Like in, in the beginning of the project, we contributed to the Japanese Society for AI. So they set up ethical guidelines in 2017. Then after that, we joined government com committee and run by Ministry of International Affairs and Communications. And we joined the, the AI research and development guidelines. And this was later proposed to OECD. And also we contributed to AI utilization and guidelines in 2019. And Cabinet Office of Japan was also forming social principles of human-centric AI. And this was later proposed to G20 in 2019. And we are also contributing to the international community, IEEE. So this is an electrical and electronic engineers society and they issued ethically aligned design and we joined this committee. Then the second challenge is personal life repository. So it is about personal data management. So how should personal information be managed? So this is a big question. Either like a big IT companies hold such data or either government you know, hold such data. In AIP, so we propose an individual-based system. So this is quite different from company-based or government-based. So in our case, so data subjects control data accessibility. So we control data accessibility by ourselves. And we basically encrypt our personal information, and put it on, on the cloud, public cloud, like Google Drive or Dropbox. So then because it is you know, encrypted, there's no information leakage in principle. And also we can simply use standard public cloud. So it's quite low cost deployment. And as a proof of com concept, so already thousands of high schoolers share their learning records with the school management system. So we are trying to further extend it, its applicability. Okay, then the third topic is machine learning theory. So this part is a bit complicated, but important. So nowadays, so deep learning is really the key technology in AI. And deep learning model is basically described like this. It has some input layer and several hidden layers and output layer. So information is coming from the left-hand side and through several hidden layers, it is output. So stacking many layers. Because of this many layer structure, actually optimization is quite difficult. So it contains like a lot of tuning parameters here on arrows. So then optimization is something like this. So we want to find the global minimum here, but it's very difficult. Usually we end up in finding just a local optimum like located here. Although this is hard to optimize, it actually works quite well in many practical applications. So we wanted to prove that. So deep learning is really good. We want to understand why it works well. And already we, we had several very interesting mathematical results. The first result is even though optimization landscape is something like this, so it's quite difficult to optimize, but we can show that by some standard algorithm, global optimization is possible. Like we can always find a solution here. And also we can prove that deep learning actually has better prediction accuracy for high dimensional data than previous methods. Then finally, so deep learning has this kind of complicated structure, network structure, but it actually has a universality. So it can approximate whatever functions. So this is quite powerful. So we had a nice mathematical result here. Then the second issue is weakly supervised learning. So as I said before, 
collecting supervised data is actually quite expensive. Like we need to ask medical doctors or teachers to label data, annotate data. So this is quite costly. But sometimes weekly label data, weekly supervised data can be easily collected. For example, let's consider click prediction in online ad. So it is easy to automatically collect clicked ad. So this is regarded as positive data, clicked. But non-clicked ad does not necessarily mean it's negative because non-clicked ad can be you know, disliked by users or users like those ads, but they don't have time to click those ads. So we, we can't distinguish them. Then such you know, unclicked ads are actually regarded as unlabeled. So we don't know whether it's positive or negative yet. So in that situation, so we don't have positive and negative data, but we only have positive data and unlabeled data. But still we can prove that we can you know, train a classifier only from positive and unlabeled data. So this is a typical weekly supervised learning. And now this is more generalized and we have like a unified theory of weekly supervised learning. Then finally, causal inference. So correlation and causality are different. So here's a typical example. So we have on the horizontal axis, we have the amount of cho chocolate consumption. And the vertical axis is the number of Nobel Prize you know, winning. Then actually, interestingly, the correlation is really strong. So correlation coefficient is 0 0.79. So this basically means that we can predict the number of Nobel Prize winners by chocolate consumption. So this is true. But this does not mean so eating more chocolate increased the number of Nobel Prize winners. It's clear. So to understand the relation between these two, so we usually need to do randomized controlled trial. So we split the subject into two groups and treat only one group and see what happens. So in this kind of chocolate case, maybe it's fine, it's possible. But if you see like vaccine for coronavirus, for example, then we have an escal problem. So we can't really do this randomized control trial. So then that's the technology of causal inference. So we want to predict the causal relation without having real intervention. But in this causal inference, how to handle hidden cause behind is a big challenge. Like in the previous example of chocolate and Nobel Prize, like the real cause was GDP. So if GDP is high, that country has a, uh, can eat a lot of chocolate and it can also have a lot of Nobel Prize. So GDP was the key issue, but it didn't appear in the graph. So under this situation, so we developed the first method to estimate the entire structure in the presence of hidden cores. Actually, the technology is quite interesting. So it's, it's like a speech separation technique is used to separate hidden cores. So we had the result just last year. Okay, then final part, future challenges. So the best way to train a machine learning system is to use high quality big label data. This is always true. So we need to always make effort to collect good data. Like, like we need principal data management guidelines or safe data sharing systems, efficient data collection mechanisms. And also we can use simulation-based machine learning or we need scalable machine learning systems. So these are quite important challenges. But at the same time, if high quality big label data is not available, like in the case of natural disaster, so it is in principle impossible to collect high quality big label data. Then we need novel machine learning theories. Still fundamental research is quite important. Like how to cope with small samples or weakly supervised or noise, noise robust machine learning. And also nowadays, this reliable machine learning is becoming an important issue against adversarial attacks. Like here's a famous example. So here's a panda image on, image on the left-hand side. So now I have a nice like deep learning system that can classify panda accurately, like 57% confidence. But if we add the small noise to this panda image, we have the right-hand side, this image. 
maybe you, 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 you can't really see the difference between these two images, but it is only slightly different. But this only slightly different image is misclassified by deep learning. Like now this is classified as gibbon. It, it's a monkey with 99% confidence. So this is actually a dangerous situation. So if it's a panda, it's not a big issue. But suppose it's a stop sign and you are driving an autonomous driving car. Then suppose I put some small sticker on, on the stop sign. Then your car may mis, uh, misclassify that, misunderstand it, and it, it is regarded as 100 kilometers. Then the cars cannot stop. But this kind of thing can happen in principle. So that was pointed out like five, six years ago. So this is a big challenge for us to overcome such a problem. So AI research has started in 1950s, and there was a big boom in 1960s and 80s. And also there's another neuro-inspired AI research community. And, and there are also two booms, like 1960s and 1980s. Then after that, so we had a statistical machine learning boom around the year 2000. Actually, I started machine learning research from around here. So then now we are in the era of deep learning. So deep learning is basically the combination of this multi-layer perceptron idea and statistical machine learning. So it uses several nice techniques here. So then the future AI must also involve this classical AI ideas, symbolic and logical thing. So maybe the next generation AI may integrate such elements. Or maybe we want to have human-like AI. But then question is, so is human-like AI really ultimate AI? So future AI, I believe, needs not be autonomous. Future AI may learn together with humans. So I, I'm thinking of this because two years ago, we had actually a fashion show together with Professor Aihara at, at University of Tokyo and prof professional fashion designer, Emma Rie. And this was actually really done in the campus of University of Tokyo as a part of Amazon Fashion Week. And in this project, we had an AI system and also a professional designer, Emma Rie here. And they are teaching you know, together like, like this. So AI suggests something to her, then she had new idea and give it back to AI. And this was you know, repeated many times. And in the end, she had a very creative ideas. So that could be a you know, part of future AI. So AI needs to be inclusive to human society because we are using AI in there. So to do so, not only technologies, but you know, technology multiplied with human creativity or culture ethics. So these are quite important. But nowadays, unfortunately, the communities are a bit separated. So technology people are only doing technology and humanity people are doing only humanity research. So we need to somehow combine them and have the next generation AI. So that's, I think, is an important challenge to the future. And hopefully we can pursue this direction in the near future. Okay, thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you, Masashi, for that uh, really inspiring talk. Um, I have been, I, I think I can uh, fairly confidently say that I've been trying very hard over the lockdown to win some Nobel prizes by eating lots of chocolate. <laughs> uh, um, also, I think uh, one of the things that you talked about resonated very well with me. Uh, towards the end, you mentioned um, the, the fact that uh, machine learning and sort of AI systems need to collaborate very closely with more traditional techniques, but also with humans. So uh, in, in the world of robotics, uh, this we kind of term shared autonomy, where a, a large part of decision making, autonomous decision making is now augmented very much by clever human sort of contextual decision making, uh, which basically marries the best of both worlds. So I think there is a very good resonance to what you just said. Um, so let me start by asking, uh, uh, but before, before I do that, um, let me remind the uh, people who are listening in to please go ahead and uh, ask questions related to Masashi's talks on the Q&A um, 
uh, sort of button, uh, and we will try and uh, tease out some of those questions and answer as much as we can. So um, before we go to the audience questions, I've got a few um, sort of clarifications and questions um, for Masashi. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to ask was uh, related to um, false negatives and false positives. And this is very important because you mentioned a lot of um, uh, you know, technologies related to clever classification technologies, identifying patterns uh, using deep learning and other machine learning techniques. Um, but there are some applications in which false positives are not so bad and false negatives are bad. And there are some applications which are other way around. The false negatives are bad and false positives are bad, are, 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 are okay. So uh, this is particularly poignant with things like coronavirus and sort of test testing and efficacy of PCR tests and lateral flow tests. So any insights that you have in terms of ensuring machine learning techniques can be biased towards one or the other? Okay, thank you very much for the great question. So yes, this is a very important issue and standard machine learning technique try to like improve the classification accuracy. So this is you know useful only when like positives and negatives are balanced. But, but as Setu said, in real world, maybe the cost is not balanced or data is not balanced. In that case, so we have another you know, metric like area under the ROC curve, for example. So this kind of thing is already you know, used in the systems. So there, actually we are controlling the balance of false negative and false positive. But like sometimes in real world, in particular in Japan, so people sometimes want 100% you know, safety. So this is really, really tough. So if we are allowed to you know, have 1% false positive, for example, then we can reduce the false negatives drastically. But if we need to really keep false positives zero, then false negatives can be really you know, brought up. So this is maybe kind of like in, in the case of autonomous driving cars. Of, of course, we, we don't want the car to have you no know, traffic accident, but making it zero is almost impossible. So if we are allowed to take like 0.001%, then this like, small margin allows us to improve the false negatives a lot. So I mean, to accept this kind of situation, perhaps the society has also changed, right? So some, sometimes people believe that computers are perfect, but this is not really true in the case of statistical machine learning. So everything is you know, probabilistic. Absolutely. I think uh, that, that's, that's a very good point that you make, um, that it's not just machine learning, but, but essentially, legislation, the government, all of these people have to play together uh, because um, people may accept certain kind of natural human errors, but people, as you said, really believe or, or want to believe that machine learning systems are, are perfect. So that brings me to the next point. Um, and you touched upon that very briefly about bias and explainability. So um, Again, as you probably very well know, at the Alan Turing Institute in London, one of the key focuses are on ensuring that the deployment of these machine learning techniques um, are done in an ethically, you know, um, uh, kind of safe and um, correct way. We do not disadvantage one community or the other. So you also mentioned at Rikin, you've got a big program working in that area. But from a machine learning perspective, how hard is it to um, focus on good results versus explainable results. Yeah, that's actually a very nice point. And actually, there's a kind of trade-off between like high accuracy and high interpretability. So in a sense, if you want one you know, machine learning system, system to achieve both, so this is actually quite difficult. But one good compromise is to have two, two systems. One is, is really accurate, but not interpretable. But we can also prepare another system that only use, that is only used for explaining something. So this is one possibility. And actually, we had a bit similar discussion yesterday with humanity people and very serious discussion. And yeah, kind of ethically, you know, right deployment of machine learning is you know, really challenging. And of course, you know, everybody wants so, but still, it's not that clear what, what is you know, fair, or, you know, what, what is clear. So then. So as a like, machine learning researcher, what, what I believe is like, if data is biased, then the results should also be biased in the same way. That, that's what I naturally expect. 
So then from the researcher's viewpoint, so, so our method should be kind of consistent. So we just have the same you know, bias from the data to the system. But at the same time, we should have a certain you know, parameter to control the certain constraint. So in the real world, maybe we have some additional constraint to be fair. So then so machine learning system can you know, naturally incorporate that kind of additional constraints. Uh, that that's a great point, and sort of, um, and I think we've been we've been dealing with that issue um, in, from a very slightly different perspective. So whenever we talk about, you know, a goodness of learning, a goodness of uh, of an of an employ of a of a deployment, you know, one of the things that obviously people formalize this is in terms of cost functions and goodness criterion, um, and and one of the key challenges is how do we define. Uh, a goodness criterion, uh, a fitness function in, in classical GA terms or, or sort of, you know, sampling based methods or cost functions in optimization techniques. How do we define um, a, a, a sort of fitness functions that are both uh, giving you the results that you expect, but are fair from, um, from, from different objectives? And I think that is quite a hard and interesting question. Um, so let me let me uh, now switch slowly to sort of uh, questions from the audience. So thank you all for for putting some of the questions on your chat. So one of the questions that came up, uh, and this is I think inspired by uh, your um, example of grading um, ex essays for entry <clears throat> exams uh, in, in in Japan. So one of the questions that came up was um, if you have an AI system learn how to grade, system, grade an essay, will we eventually converge towards um, goodness criterion or, or some sort of metric which pleases the AI rather than which pleases the, the human or, 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 or any other notion? Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Actually, this is true for any I think, education system. Like initially, people are like studying in their own way. So then, actually, data is somehow diverse. So then, machine learning system is trained on those diverse data. So that's why prediction and evaluation can be done, you know, quite well. But after that, once the system is deployed, then many students are using that system and just you know overfit to the system. Then everybody basically have the kind of same essay, same kind of essay with high scores. Then the data is again biased. Then the next system trained on these biased data is actually in the end quite biased. So from that viewpoint, actually this kind of system cannot survive for a long, long time. So I, I think more important, like in the case of entrance exam, more important is not, not to take good scores, but to find good match between students and universities or schools. So that, that's I think the next stage of like AI deployment in education. Perfect. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so I've, I've got a couple of questions uh, that is coming in related to hardware infrastructure and the kinds of uh, things that you need to do effective research because you touched upon um, the ability to do large scale computing. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, um, um, you, you guys have a very close collaboration, I think with Fujitsu on this kind of uh, uh, cluster computing uh, technologies. So there is a couple of questions that is related to uh, the, so, so who will be able to do good machine learning? How can we democratize machine learning? Will it become the, um, the, the, the special ability of large scale companies or very rich, um, you know, uh, institutions or research firms, um, because we need very specialized computing equipment, or do you see um, things where we can democratize uh, machine learning? And there's a related question on the future of AI and quantum computing. It may be quite a hard thing to, think <laughs> about, but, but, you know, so over to you. Yeah, so thank you very much for the great questions. So I, I think to, to make machine learning more accessible, I think there are two issues. One is like, data and the other is computational resources. And about data, I think we have been already working. So without having fully you know, labeled data, we can somehow train machine learning systems nowadays. This allows like small companies to train their own system from some 
you know, low quality data. So that's one thing. But right, computational resources is really the key. Like at Riken, we are lucky. So there's another you know, Riken Center for Computational Sciences, and they have a supercomputer called Fugaku. So it, it's world number one supercomputer. And actually, we, we can access that, that computer. So we, we are lucky. But right, so if you really want to train a big system, so big GPU cluster is needed. And nowadays, so even in the research community, there's a kind of discrimination between like those who have big computers and those who don't have big computers. So from our viewpoint, so we try to have a kind of small sample machine learning. If this, is, this becomes really possible, then we don't really need a huge computer, but we can use our laptop to train a quite state-of-the-art systems. But still, uh, to achieve that, it, it's a you know, long way to go. I don't know, quantum computers can really solve this problem. Well, who knows? I mean, I think uh, there are possible, the possibilities are, are, are infinite. Um, so, so one of the sort of, another sort of question uh, is, is about um, as AI becomes more advanced, um, and if most of the decisions will rely on, on AI suggestions. So I, I presume this question is, is related to things like, um, you know, a jurisdiction of, of um, some cases, whether, you know, whether you use AI systems to prove or disprove whether you are guilty of a crime or not, um, or we work on other AI systems like, um, you know, if you, if you say, for example, monitor your health, and based on that, you are um, being offered a particular premium um, at on, on buying life insurance, for example. So the, I think the question is more about um, how do we ensure that such techniques are, are used in a way that is um, morally and ethically correct. Um, so do you believe that it is the responsibility of the machine learners to ensure that the results or the outputs of the, uh, uh, the machine learning systems that you are developing are used in a way that is fair? Right, that's a very difficult question. And maybe some, some legal issues are also behind, right? So purely from a scientific viewpoint, I think we can't really guarantee anything, right? So uh, if data is noisy, then output is also noisy. So we can't really guarantee. Maybe with some probability, we can say something mathematically, but otherwise so there's no guarantee. So then, so finally we need a law. Right? So like in, in the case of autonomous driving car, and if the car hits a boy or girl, for example, then so who is responsible? So this is a kind of standard question. So then, so th here the law should appear. Right? Either the manufacturers is the problem, or owners of the car is a problem, or driver is a problem. So we need a new regulation for for this kind of you know AI society. So th that's why I think many discussions are ongoing now, and maybe this also depends on countries. So that that's another headache, right? AI system is kind of universal across countries, but depending on the law, maybe the same system cannot be used in the same way. Absolutely. And I think um, this is this is an e excellent point to kind of highlight that, I mean, Masashi briefly mentioned that um, with, the, with the Japanese uh, AI and Robotics Institute, we were also d exploring collaborations at various levels, whether be it the, in the level of machine learning, whether be it in terms of you know, legislation. So the Turing Institute uh, has an MOU that has been signed um, a couple of years ago, uh, which essentially tries to exploit the best of both worlds in terms of saying, uh, here's what um, is, is accepted practice and norms in the Western world. Here's, um, let's look at the society from a different perspective, from your perspective for different needs. Um, and I think it's important that a, a a very vibrant collaboration uh, happens. So there was a question on collaboration between sort of Japan and the UK. Um, and there was a question about, could you introduce an example of a collaboration between machine learning uh, in the UK and Japan? And I think I can think of two things straight away. So as part of the uh, a joint funding program, there was one program from David Leslie in, in, in the Alan Turing Institute working uh, with uh, some of the um, PIs at Rikin on looking at 
the contextual uh, aspects of uh, legislation. So, for example, in Japan, there are certain contextual elements that become very important. And I think um, this is where context and local knowledge becomes very important in deciding um, you know, law. Um, so, so maybe you have some thoughts on how such collaborations could be you know, fostered and, and improved. Yeah, I think we can consider several different layers. Maybe, maybe the easiest one would be students. Right? So uh, I think somebody has asked already a question that in internship is definitely one of the best ways. Like in particular in computer science and AI, young people are really the you know, main, main players in the society. So then, so we are happy to have like students from UK and also maybe postdocs from UK. And hopefully some Japanese can also work in London and UK. So that would be great. So then industry level is also kind of straightforward, right? If one company is interested in working with like, academia in Japan or some companies in Japan is interested in working with universities in UK, so then so they can have naturally collaboration project. So then more like university, university collaboration is somewhat complicated. Like my case, I am working on theoretical machine learning. Then basically, you know, just agreement is fine. We don't really need funding, but you know, just discussion over Zoom and writing papers together is fine. But like robotics, like you, so you need to develop something in reality. Then you need funding. And sometimes, you know, moving funding ac across countries is a bit complicated. So that's something, again, this, we should go beyond some systems. Absolutely. And, and I think um, one of the things that, that kind of really, um, one of the things that came to my mind was Japan has this moonshot project uh, in AI. And uh, indeed, uh, we are collaborating with a couple of projects as part of the moonshot project. Um, and, and we do we do indeed see the barriers uh, of moving funding across. But I think that does not prevent us from uh, exchange of personnel, exchange of students, exchange of ideas. And I think that that's, that's an excellent opportunity to do that. Um, so, so one, uh, probably we're coming to the end of this, um, these, um, the time that we have. Um, one last question um, is also related to your uh, kind of very interesting example that you had about uh, the fashion industry. So mm -hmm. there was a question about whether there is an, you, whether you have faced or you've seen uh, any fundamental uh, resistance by traditional industries like the creative industry in, in say, you know, art or fashion or uh, food uh, uh, to accepting solutions from AI techniques? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's clear. So there are two kinds of people. So one is quite open to new technology and the other is extremely conservative. So not only in art or fashion, but also you know, in research, right? So some people are, you know, still, still like to do experiments by themselves, but uh, some more advanced researchers are interested in doing like AI-based simulation to find something quickly. So, but things are changing, I think, slowly. Excellent, uh, good. Uh, so I think we're gonna more or less stop here, but um, so I think there was one question about um, internships and you mentioned that the internships, the physical internships are stopped at the moment due to travel restrictions, but uh, are you um, accepting some form of online or some sort of uh, remote internships? Somebody was asking. Yeah, so I, I don't know whether I should call it internship, but I have like personal project with like student abroad. So it's just, you know, no contract, but we are just, you know, discussing online and writing papers together. So this is always possible. But now actually we are trying to kind of have a new alternative system to work with students abroad. So hopefully we can announce something new in the near future. Perfect. Uh, yeah, on that note, uh, again, I want to thank Masashi for the wonderful insights. Um, I have had the pleasure and the opportunity to visit, uh, I mean, I spent seven years in Japan doing my master's and PhD. I, I love the country. I take every opportunity to go back and I've had the, um, the, the honor and the opportunity to be involved in one of your uh, evaluations, uh, maybe three or four, two years back, I think. And I could firsthand see the, the tremendous work that you're doing across the, the domains uh, in, in that institution. And I hope we get an opportunity to meet again face to face and have some of these yeah. events. 
um, soon. Uh, but um, again, thank you to all the participants, uh, all the attendees for their exciting set of questions. Um, and thank you to Japan House and the Embassy of uh, Japan in, in, uh, in London for, for hosting this event. And finally, also thank you to Turing, the Alan Turing Institute, uh, my host institution and the University of Edinburgh for, for making this happen. Um, so uh, on that note, can I pass that back to Simon and thank you once again, Masashi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, what a wonderful um, presentation, Professor Sugiyama, marvelous. And thank you very much indeed, Professor Vijayakumar, for, for moderating and taking care of this uh, for us today. Very, very privileged to have you both. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you also to uh, the co-organizers, uh, the Embassy of Japan, and thank you to everybody here. And Japan House London will send attendees a, a quick uh, feedback questionnaire by email just after this, uh, and please do fill that in with your comments. It uh, will be most appreciated. Just to say what's coming up at Japan House London um, as we as we open up here here in here in London, um, we have uh, a screening of Lost Textile of UQ in partnership with NHK World Japan, uh, a series of documentary screenings exploring uh, diversity of Japanese textiles until the twenty fifth of July. We also have a screening of Tango Chili Men, which is about uh, silk crepe, also with uh, NHK World. Our exhibition on our ground floor is about to start from the 17th of July. This is called Connect, Individual and Group by Tokoro Asao, uh, who of course is, is at the moment uh, really rather uh, getting to be very well known through, through the Olympic and Paralympic game uh, logo designs. And in connection with our next exhibition, which will be coming up, is the Witches of the Orient, an online discussion with lecturer, director Julian Farrell. We have an exhibition coming up all about the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games. Thank you once again so much. It's been absolutely wonderful to hear you today. Thank you so much. I hope indeed we can all meet in person, maybe at Japan House in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.